Good evening. Welcome to our prayer meeting and Bible study tonight. Let us begin by singing a well-known, well-loved hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land. Let us pray. O oh, great God, Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour and Lord, we come to you on this evening. We do give you thanks, Lord, for granting us the opportunity, the health and the time to be able to do so. We thank you for the desire in our hearts to come and hear your word and pray to you to fellowship with each other, Lord, even remotely over the technology that we have, for which we give you thanks. And we thank you, Father, that you are with us by your Spirit, that you have come to us uh, in this new covenant uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ and also through the Spirit. We praise you that you are with us and that you will never leave nor forsake us. Help us now as we Come aside, Father, from the things of this day, the things of the week so far. Uh, Lord, whatever has passed, whatever is to come, we lay it to one side and we look to you now, Lord. We come near to hear the words of the Lord our God, to humble ourselves before you. Uh, we pray you would increase our faith, Lord, and increase our love, increase our hope, increase all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what a wonderful salvation is ours. We do praise you, Lord, for your amazing mercy toward us, your amazing grace. Thank you for saving us out of the ashes, Lord, out of the, the dung heap, out of our sin and death. We do praise you that you have redeemed us, not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, far more valuable. He who is like a lamb without blemish and without spot. Thank you that he was foreordained for us in eternity, that this should take place, that he should redeem the people in that covenant of redemption. And we thank you he has been made manifest in these last times for us. 
Father, we do pray that you would strengthen us tonight, that we would uh, have our minds open to understand the scriptures, and that our hearts would burn within us as you speak to us. Lord, that we would, having been fed, be in a position to nourish others with the words of truth. May these things not pass from our minds, Lord. May we think upon them. May they do us good, and may they change us. Lord, we do pray that you would help us as we come to pray. We pray you lay on our hearts the burdens uh, that we should be bringing to you, the petitions and how to make them. We pray for the help of the Spirit as we come to pray, as well as in hearing, Lord, that we would, uh, through him, uh, intercede with you and make intercession. And with groanings that cannot be uttered, he would uh, make that intercession through us. Please, Lord, do help us to come boldly to the throne of grace with great eagerness and gladness and great confidence because we have a great high priest who was tempted in all points as we are yet without sin Christ our perfect spotless righteousness at the right hand of God we do thank you for the wonderful graces and benefits that are ours then Lord in this uh, wonderful new covenant we thank you for uh, these things that we enjoy this evening please bless and help us we pray be with our brethren who couldn't join us tonight bless them where they are and please be with us O God forgive us we pray all our sins evil thoughts words and deeds thank you that uh, you have said that if we confess them uh, you will cleanse us from these things from all unrighteousness you will forgive us our sins we do praise you for this in Jesus name Amen Well, let's read uh, Joshua chapter 3, uh, reading tonight, Joshua chapter 3. Joshua, the sixth book of the Old Testament, and the third chapter, Joshua 3. Let's hear the word of God. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Acacia Grove, or Shittim, and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here, and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe. And it shall come to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the Ark of the Lord the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest, that the waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaratan. So the waters that went down into the Sea of the Araba, the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off, and the people crossed over opposite Jericho. 
Then the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground, until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. Today is the 1st of July. That means we're now halfway through the year. What a year so far it's been. Coronavirus has controlled our lives and changed our world. In England, we're slowly emerging out of lockdown, businesses reopening, as well as churches now, albeit with severe restrictions. The threat of a second wave of the virus remains with the reimposition of lockdown that that would bring. Face masks, social distancing, online services, shielding, this has become our new normal. And it seems likely that at least some of these things will be with us a while yet. You have not passed this way before. As I considered what to preach on tonight, it was that phrase that came to mind. You have not passed this way before. I couldn't remember if it was in Deuteronomy or Joshua. I thought it was in one of those. But a quick Google search revealed the answer, as we all know. It's Joshua chapter 3. Israel crossing the Jordan. Now this chapter contains some very valuable and timely truths for us in the situation in which we find ourselves halfway through 2020. This is not the start of a series on Joshua. I'm sorry if that's a disappointment. Hopefully we will start a new midweek series on the 26th of August. I know that seems a long way away, but we have interactive Bible studies and other speakers uh, before then. So tonight is just a one-off, but I trust it will be helpful. I want us to consider four things in this chapter. Firstly, in verses 1 to 6, the need for God's guidance. Secondly, in verses 7 and 8, the man of God's choosing. Thirdly, in verses 9 to 13, the promise of God's word. And finally, fourthly, in verses 14 to 17, the display of God's power. So firstly, the need for God's guidance. Joshua and Israel are encamped at Shittim on the east side of the River Jordan, opposite Jericho. They know where they need to go into Canaan, the promised land, but they don't know how to get there. Certainly, they do not know the best route. True, they have already sent a couple of spies into Jericho itself, who must have therefore reached, crossed and recrossed the river. For two fit men, that's no problem. But for thousands upon thousands of people, of all ages, with their livestock and possessions too? Well, that's something else entirely. They need help. They need guidance. And they have it. In fact, they have the very best guidance and help that they could wish for. The Lord their God himself. Verse 2 says, So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. The ark was a coffin-like box made of wood that contained the Ten Commandments, the two tablets of the testimony. It was a symbol of the Lord's presence. It was most holy. It would eventually go in the most holy place in the temple and, and now within the tabernacle. Only the Kohathites, that's the priestly division of the Levites, were allowed to carry it on poles. And even they couldn't touch it on pain of death. For this cause, the people always kept a respectable distance from the ark. Now, though, there is another reason for them to hang back, and that was for guidance. Look at verse 4. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. That's a little over half a mile. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. All the people needed to be able to see the ark. They could not do that if they were following too closely to it. They needed to be able to see it in the distance, not too far away, but not too close. God himself then, uh, presencing himself within this 
object, this sacred object, he would lead them safely through the unfamiliar, inhospitable terrain that lay before them. What a privilege that was for Israel. As Dale Ralph Davis says, the whole affair here is Yahweh's feet, the Lord's feet, his accomplishment. And the Israelites, though active, are still primarily spectators. Even so, there are two things that they could do. Number one, they must follow the ark, as we said, as we heard in verse 3. You shall set out from your place and go after it. They had to follow. And secondly, they were to consecrate themselves. Look at verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, Sanctify or consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Mighty miracles. As another writer says, wonders are events designed to demonstrate the power of Israel's God over other peoples and on behalf of his own people. The holy awesome acts of God on behalf of his people demand a response of holiness from his people. Be holy for I am holy. Not just ceremonial purity, washing, sexual abstinence, but moral also confession of sin, repentance was called for here the Lord was about to do something great the least that they could do was to acknowledge that by preparing themselves in this way sanctify yourselves Joshua said so here is the need for God's guidance and the need for God's guidance has not diminished with the passage of time neither thankfully has the Lord's provision of that guidance in the New Testament, of course, we don't have a physical object like the ark to guide us. We have something better. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have God himself, the third person of the Trinity. In fact, every member of the Trinity uh, comes to live within the Christian by the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.14 says that those, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. By definition, we are led, we're guided by the Spirit, wondrously. We have a complete Bible. This is how the Spirit guides us primarily. He speaks to us through the Scriptures. He brings verses to our remembrance. Uh, we have a complete Bible that is not only able to make us wise to salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ, but is able to thoroughly equip us unto every good work. Charles Wesley has a lovely hymn that's in our hymn book. And one of the verses includes this. It's a captain of Israel's host and guide. Second verse, I think, says this. By thine unerring spirit led, we shall not in the desert stray. We shall not full direction need, lack, nor miss our providential way. As far from danger as from fear, while love, almighty love, is near. Are we patiently waiting? looking for our father's leading not running ahead of him but waiting on the lord is our prayer that of jesus not as i will but as you will are we sanctifying ourselves obeying his revealed will because we can't expect him to guide us in things that he hasn't revealed you know should i do this or should i do that if we're not of a mind to observe what he has revealed it would be hypocritical would it not to expect God to guide us in the affairs of our lives when we when we ignore what he has said he wants us to do will we do what we saw on Sunday David did and what we see now that Israel did setting the Lord always before us turning our eyes upon Jesus looking unto him the author and finisher of our faith for he has promised to guide us his people when he the spirit of truth has come he will guide you into all truth. John 16 verse 13. Yes, that primarily applies to those 11 apostles. But it also applies to us. He will guide you into all truth. Even if we haven't passed this way before. This situation that we find ourselves in. He has. The Lord has been through every temptation, every trial we could possibly think of. And he says to us, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Therefore, 
beloved, seeing as we have received such promises, let us cleanse ourselves, sanctify, consecrate ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. There's the need for God's guidance in those opening verses. It's a need that we have and that is also provided for. Secondly, let's look at the man of God's choosing. The man of God's choosing. It's true, as the psalmist says, that the Lord God of Israel alone does wondrous things. It's also the case that he never does anything without good reason. Sometimes his reasons are not revealed to us, but often they are. And so it is here. In fact, we're given two explanations in the text and a, and a further one in chapter four for this miracle of crossing the Jordan. First reason is in verse seven. And the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Now the priests were to bear the ark, yet they would proceed at Joshua's direction. Verse eight, you shall command the priests who bear the ark of the covenant saying, when you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. It was also Joshua who would address the people in verse 9, which we'll come to in a moment. Again, establishing his God-given authority to lead the nation. They, he was the one they should obey. Moses, who had recently died atop Mount Nebo, was revered by Israel. Yet at the beginning of his ministry, back in Exodus, he too required vindication in the sight of of the people. If you remember, Moses was very anxious about going to his people Israel and he tried to get out of it. Um, but God sent him and God empowered him to, to do miracles, gave him uh, the power to do wonderful things, the 10 plagues and so on. He also sent Aaron to be the spokesman uh, for him. Uh, and even then, after Moses and Aaron had done these wonders in their sight, uh, the Israelites still frequently complained and grumbled against Moses, didn't they? Uh, all through the wilderness wanderings. Now Joshua has already proved his worth as Moses' assistant. Uh, he fought the Amalekites in battle in Exodus chapter 17. Uh, from Exodus uh, 19 onwards, he, he was with Moses uh, uh, to an extent on the Mount of Sinai when the giving of the law took place. And uh, he was one of the two faithful spies of the twelve sent into the promised land to bring back a report. And he and Caleb brought back a good and accurate report, unlike the others. So Joshua has already proved his caliber. And yet the task now before Israel is so huge, going into this land across this mighty river and driving out all these nations. The task is so enormous that both he and they, the people, need reassurance that he was indeed the right man for the job, that God was with him. The crossing of the Jordan in miraculous fashion was designed to provide that assurance and it certainly achieved its aim. Imparting the swollen river before Joshua, just as he had parted the Red Sea before Moses, in Exodus 40, the Lord demonstrated that Israel's new leader had his full support that his seal was upon him, his power rested on him. And it had the, des the desired effect. There's very little complaining recorded against Joshua's leadership in the book that bears his name. Compared with Moses, he seems to have gotten off very lightly in that respect, which is good, that's how it should be. When leaders lead in Israel, when the people give themselves willingly, bless the Lord, Deborah said. In the providence of God, Joshua succeeded where Moses had failed, bringing his nation into the promised land, vanquishing their enemies, dividing their inheritance to them by lot. And in this, he stands as a type of him who was to come, the Messiah, Christ, who, as it turns out, would be his namesake. Joshua in English, Yeshua in Hebrew, Jesus in Greek, that is, Jesus same name. What the law could not do, God did, sending his son 
You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will bring them into their inheritance. This Jesus God has raised up. God has raised up, being exalted to the right hand of God, as Joshua was exalted. And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, which he proceeded to pour out upon the church. Fulfilling Moses' wish, by the way, that all God's people should be prophets. By him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. All New Testament scriptures showing how Joshua uh, and Moses are a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his work something better we have in him so this is the man of God's choosing not your pastor not myself but your savior the chief shepherd Jesus is our great Joshua who gives us the victory thanks be to God who leads us always in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place Jesus said, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. How will he do this? He will take of what is mine, he said, and he will declare it to you. That's what the spirit delights to do. He shows us Jesus Christ. He doesn't draw attention to himself. You are complete in him, Paul says, who is the head of all principality and power. Jesus is the man of God's choosing, the God man. So let's keep Christ central in our piety, in our religion, in our prayer life, uh, in our devotion. Remember the Lord always. Keep Christ central and you will, you will not go far wrong. You cannot go far wrong if you do that. We're told in chapter 4 verse 14 that on that day, the day Israel crossed the Jordan, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. And they feared him as they had feared Moses all the days of his life. Well, how much more should we fear, respect our wonderful Lord Jesus? As Luther says in his great hymn, facing all the foes that we face with force of arms, we nothing can. Full soon were we downridden, but for us fights the proper man whom God himself hath bidden. Ask ye, who is this same? Christ Jesus is his name. The Lord surveyeth son, the Lord of hosts. He and no other one shall conquer in the battle. Fear him, ye saints, and you will then have nothing else to fear. Make you his service your delight. Your wants shall be his care. So that's the man of God's choosing. In the Old Testament, at this point, Joshua, in the New Testament, and forevermore, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, let's consider the promise of God's word promise of God's word. History's greatest generals have not only been skilled warriors and expert strategists, they've also been leaders who could inspire their men through the power of the spoken word. And Joshua the son of Nun was such a one. In fact, I dare say he was one of the greatest, for his speech here is not his own, but God's. Look at verse 9. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. These words consisted of a description of what was about to happen in verse 11 and verse 13. A conditional requirement for Israel, what they must do in verse 12. And also, first of all, an explanation of why God was doing this. The second reason for the miracle. We saw the first one in verse 7. Here's the second in verse 10. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. The Lord is going to do these things. The Lord has said that Israel must know that he was with Joshua, verse 7. And now Joshua says that they 
must know that he, the Lord, is with them, with the people, among you. Verse 10. Now in true humility, Joshua has nothing to say of himself. His promised exaltation has not gone to his head. Instead, he exalts God. Just as Christ exalted God, calling him the living God, as opposed to dead idols, the Lord of all the earth or land. Yahweh is Lord of the land of Canaan that they are going to possess. And this is why they can possess it. It belongs to God to give to whomever he will. Indeed, he's the ruler over every land. The whole planet is his possession. Lord of all the earth. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. That includes the Canaanites, the seven nations listed here. God made them and he is able to unmake them, to destroy them. That's what he has determined to do after much long suffering, hundreds of years, in punishment for their gross wickedness. Israel is his people. And they are his avenging angel, so to speak, bringing divine justice upon these rebellious Canaanites. Let Israel not doubt that God can and will do this through them and for them. And so that they may know and be assured of his promise, he is about to perform one of his greatest miracles. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off. And so shall their enemies in like manner afterwards. Joshua's point is, as Ralph Davis says, if God can get you into the land, he can surely give you the land. The miracle is predicted, its significance is explained, with the result that Israel's faith and courage are increased. The promise of God's word. Joshua spoke to the people. Do you see how important the word of the Lord is? There are some folk today, even professing Christians, who despise the word or who at least downplay it relative to uh, the miraculous. Uh, we don't want any more sermons. Some say we want the miracles. Show us them. Yet, according to the Apostle Paul, at a time that miracles were undoubtedly taking place in the first century of uh, the church, According to Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 28, teaching comes before miracles, working of miracles and importance in Christ's church. Look it up. Apostles, most important, then prophets, then teachers. And after that, miracles and so forth. You see, without the word of God giving the explanation, the miracle makes no sense. The word must come and explain what's happening. Usually it will predict the miracle in advance uh, and the miracle, the miracle's purpose is to authenticate the message of the word, not, not the other way around. It's the same with the sacraments, with, with baptism and the Lord's Supper. The reformers stress that these things uh, need to be uh, accompanied by the preaching of the words. They are themselves visible words. You know, they give us assurance uh, through the eyes as we behold the, these things, uh, symbols of our salvation. And yet the word has to explain them. Imagine if you'd never come across the Lord's Supper or baptism before and, and they were just done without any explanation. You'd have no clue really as to what they were about. So the word of God, you see, the scripture is absolutely crucial, fundamental, primary. The Apostle Peter says that... By God's glory and virtue, exceedingly great and precious promises have been given to us. 2 Peter 1 verse 4. And where are these promises to be found? In the Bible. As Peter says at the end of that chapter, no prophecy of scripture is of any private origin, is of the prophet's own interpretation. But men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. If we want to be sure of God's promises then we need to hear and believe his word. We need to come here, draw near and hear the words of the Lord our God, just as Israel would call, call to do. We need to listen to sermons. We need to do our devotions. We need to search the scriptures in personal study with much prayer. If they hadn't done that, would the Bereans have believed in Christ? 
with the Ethiopian eunuch, the Lord having sent Philip to him. Yes, he was given a great evangelist, but first God gave him a great prophet. And not a living one, but in the scripture that he was reading, sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah. And that prepared him for the message, the words that Pete, Philip would speak. Having been converted, how is it that we grow in grace, that we are conformed to Christ, that we get to glory? Paul said to the Ephesian elders, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Israel would receive their inheritance through listening to the words of the Lord their God, and we will ours likewise. As a hymn writer says, word of the ever living God, will of his glorious son, without thee, how could earth be trod or heaven itself be won? How indeed we should never despise miracles. We shouldn't limit God, but neither should we depend on them. At the end of the day, we can do without them if need be, but we perish brethren without the promises. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God. Remember how John chapter 10 finishes. John the Baptist performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man, Jesus, were true. And many believed in Christ there. Didn't need a miracle for John to preach Christ and many believed because of his testimony he was a burning and a shining light that all might believe through him well do you believe God keeps all his promises you know we need to believe that we can believe that we can say with the psalmist remember your word to your servant upon which you caused me to hope we can say with the apostle he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Just as Joshua is saying, look, if God's going to bring you across the Jordan, he's also going to defeat your enemies for you. If God has offered up his son at Calvary, how will he not give us everything else that we need? Having given the best thing, the best one he had, what will he not bestow? For all the promises of God in him, are yes and in him amen to the glory of God through us fourthly and finally we come to the display of God's power the climax of this account at least in chapter 3 the display of God's power the author of Joshua has steadily and skillfully built up the tension in his telling of the story the true story of what happened here the officers and Joshua have spoken to the people. Joshua has spoken to the priests. The Lord has spoken to Joshua. Joshua again has spoken to the people. Now at last the time has come to bite the bullet and go forward, to go trusting in God to the Jordan. It's going to take a miracle. Will one be forthcoming? Even now the author piles on the suspense as we get towards the end of the account. Look at verse 14. Let's read this carefully. Notice all the clauses here. Um, the author's taking his time before getting to the climax there. So it was when the people set out from their camp to cross over the Jordan, with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as those who bore the Ark came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests who bore the Ark dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks during the whole time of harvest. Well, let's just stop there just to add, just to heighten the drama that little bit more. What's the point of the parenthesis, the last bit in brackets? What we're being told is that in springtime, that it is springtime in Canaan, when the rain falls and the snow melts and the river swells. In short, when there's considerably more water than at any other time, making it the worst possible time for a crossing, humanly speaking. But divinely speaking, it's the best time. Why? Because the greater Israel's extremity, the greater the glory for Israel's God. 
What is impossible with men is possible with him. And only with him. As King Nebuchadnezzar said to Daniel, the end of Daniel chapter 3, there is no other God who can save like this. That's also the point here. And he does not disappoint. Verse 16, here it is. This is what happened. The waters which came down from upstream stood still and rose in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zaraton. That's some 18 miles north of here, upstream. However, God wrought this miracle and there are a few theories as to how he may have done it. The point is that it was, it was that, it was a miracle. That is abundantly clear. I tend to think this was just a sudden, totally miraculous uh, thing without any other, uh, like God causing a mudslide or something, as some people think that's possible. But to me, the language suggests it was um, a miracle well, it was a miracle any way you look at it but just totally unusual thing to happen and the waters that went down into the sea of the arab or the salt sea the dead sea they failed and they were cut off and the, allowing the people to cross over opposite jericho when the priests left the priests who bore the ark of the covenant of the lord who was still standing on the dry ground in the middle of the riverbed uh, when the priest left, we're told in chapter 4, verse 18, the waters of the Jordan returned to their place. As soon as they stepped onto the dry land, away from the floodplain, the waters came back and overflowed all the banks just as before. Clearly miraculous. They stopped at just the right time and they restarted at just the right time. This is the display, my friends, of God's power. And it wasn't just for Joshua, it wasn't just for Israel, but it was also for everyone. If we just dip into chapter 4 again to make this point, look at verse 24 there. The last verse of chapter 4. God did this that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty. This was a message to the Canaanites to repent or else because this is who you're up against in God. This is your last chance, as it were, to turn from your evil ways and to seek mercy when Israel comes into the land. You cannot stand against such a God who can do such a thing. And if you look at chapter 5 verse 1, they, they realise that, but sadly there, there was no repentance. It was indeed a message to Israel, end of chapter 4 verse 24, that you may fear the Lord your God forever forever it was to be remembered in the future and this by the way is the reason for verse 12 of chapter 3 now therefore take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of israel one man from every tribe that's not explained until we get to chapter 4 where we see it was for these representatives of the tribes to each take a stone out of the river jordan bring it with them into the land of canaan and they were to be set up there at gilgal um, as a reminder, a perpetual reminder, so that in the future when when a father and son were, were out in the countryside um, and the son saw the stones and said to his dad, what are these all about? The father could explain the true story of what God had done. That his son also and his children and every generation might fear the Lord, their God. God's wonderful works are not to be forgotten but remembered celebrated to all generations and we're doing that now aren't we we're fulfilling prophecy in a way for this god the god of israel is our god he's the lord of the whole earth these people are our people praise him for his grace and favor to our fathers in distress praise him still the same forever slow to chide and swift to bless praise him above all for his most wondrous work at Calvary. There, my friends, 2,000 years ago, not very far from the Jordan, the great redeeming work was done, greater than this, at Calvary. The mightiest miracle, when, as the poet says, the enormous load of human guilt was on our Saviour laid. When Christ Jesus, our mediator, like these priests of old, 
Yes, just like the Ark of the Covenant, God's dwelling place, for indeed Jesus was that. When our Saviour stood, as it were, in the valley of death, holding back the tide of God's righteous judgment, which threatened to engulf us, until he had atoned for every last one of his people, so that everyone would get safely to heaven, just as every one of Israel crossed safely into Canaan. The Lord Jesus Christ did that for his Israel, purchasing us with his precious blood. That was the mightiest miracle. Here, more than anywhere, we see God's power displayed. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Great is the gospel of our glorious God. Where mercy met the anger of God's wrath, a penalty was paid and pardon bought, and sinners lost at last to him were brought. Great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the work of God's own holiness. It moves my soul and causes me to long for greater joys than to the earth belong. This is what we remember above all. Who we remember. God in Christ. These things written of him, they point to him. Types of his wonderful deliverance. For over three months we've been unable to remember the Lord as we would wish to, as he commanded us to, with bread and wine. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Hopefully that time is coming soon. We'll see. It's certainly nearer now than at the start of lockdown, of course. I hope you're missing communion. One good thing about this lockdown will be if we come to appreciate these things more. The coming together of God's people and the sacraments and so forth. But praise God, we can always remember what our Joshua did. We can remember Jesus and his death and resurrection all the time. And I trust that we do. I hope we can each say with Paul, the son of God loved me and gave himself for me. It's his love in time past that forbids us to think. He'll leave us at last in trouble to sink. And therefore we have hope. If he could deal with my sin and take away the sin of the world, the Lamb of God, well, what can he not do for me? How can I not overcome? Remember Jesus Christ often. Know and believe the love that God has for you in this wonderful display of his power. So we've seen those four points from Joshua chapter 3. Just to remind you the need for God's guidance, the man of God's choosing, the promise of God's word, and the display of God's power. I've called my sermon Safe Through Jordan. That was Israel's experience and it will also be ours. We've not been this way before and when we come to die we'll have not been that way before but the Lord Jesus Christ did and because he went through that he tasted death for us we by the grace of God might have eternal life because he lives we will also live we'll too be taken safe through Jordan although it's only halfway through 2020 July the 1st, as I said, it seems appropriate to finish with the words of the well-known poem, The Gate of the Year, a wartime poem that strengthened the people of this country in our time of greatest need. The lady writer says, God knows. And I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, Give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, Go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God trod gladly into the night. And he led me towards the hills and the breaking of day. Amen. I hope you'll be able to join us for prayer shortly over on a free conference call. 
but let's sing together first. We're going to sing a hymn uh, also by the same author as uh, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, William Williams. It's called Onward March or Conquering Jesus. Let's sing this to God's praise. <laughs> 